Okay, thanks to everyone who uh, is joining us today. Uh, we're here to talk about OSHA. Who am I? Uh, my name is Jim LeBeau, as you know, from Orrin, Reno. And the reason I'm talking to you today is because for the last 23 years, I've been handling uh, OSHA matters for employers, and I've handled cases from Maine all the way out to Guam and most points in between. And what I've found is the better prepared you are today, the better uh, you're, you're gonna fare when OSHA comes a knocking, because they're gonna come a knocking at a time when you don't want them there, or you're not prepared for them to be there. But if you prepare today, all of your downstream liability will be minimized, hopefully, uh, the better prepared you are. But let's face it, we're not. Uh, he, I'm not here to teach you how to get around uh, OSHA. Let's face it, the history of safety and health, at least in our country, is not for the long width of history, is not necessarily been a very good one. Um, and so that's why in the 70s, President Nixon signed into law the, the Occupational Safety and Health Act and the, the data on that was obvious. People were getting hurt, people were getting killed. Um, it, it was a huge expense, not only for the families, but also for the economy. So something had to happen and, and it happened at, in late uh, 1970. Um, yeah, the good old days, right? But uh, even though the OSH Act has, has been uh, signed into law, not a whole lot of people nowadays uh, actually get, have gotten the, the message. Uh, actually, I like that one because there's a lot of booze in the background there, and he's actually in a pool with with live electric coming down. What? Yeah. Hey, I think mean, it's great. I think I've been at this place. I think is in Oklahoma. So the point, obviously, the point of these slides, which a lot of folks have seen, is, is I don't know what he's thinking. Uh, is that uh, uh, you really need to be vigilant and uh, we can't be shirking our safety and health responsibilities. Having said that, when OSHA shows up, they're not your friend. They're there to um, uh, build a case against you and they're gonna show up when you least want them there. And sometimes they show up, God forbid, after fatality. I had a fatality, I've had many fatality cases, but one in particular, uh, I had in Maine where um, a landscaping company was a very large coastal landscaping company were, were on a job and they had a skid steer with the two lift arms raised. And for whatever reason, the two guys working decided that they were gonna take the door off of the skid steer. And as they were doing it, the guy in the skid steer lowered the arms on top of the head of his coworker and decapitated him. It was really a crushing accident. It was, it was awful, absolutely awful. And the owner of the company was not there, but he got there quickly and was interviewed by OSHA. And he was in such shock. He, I remember asking him afterwards, what did you say to OSHA? He said, I, I, have, I don't remember any of that. He don't remember any of the day, let alone what he said to somebody. So, um, that's that. Long story short, don't talk to OSHA on the day of an accident, especially when you're in shock. Those are those are the times. And I remember I said when I talked to the OSHA compliance officer after that accident, I said, "What did he say to you?" And he said things that weren't true because he felt so bad. He felt responsible for what had happened. And and ultimately, we convinced OSHA that what the real facts were, and they ended up actually not issuing citations in that case. They may show up after a settlement, so they're gonna to wanna to see if you've, if you've complied with what you agreed you comply with. And if you're not ready, and you're not ready for them to show up, then all kinds of increased liability situations happen. Citations, obviously, is civil liability. If you hurt somebody other than your employees, um, then you're probably gonna face civil liability. And then if there is a fatality that's the result of a willful OSHA, a regulation violation, then you will be um, investigated for criminal prosecution, not by OSHA, but by the U.S. Department of Justice. So these are places you you don't want to go, and 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 being prepared today is is how I'm going to hopefully help you. Um, things to consider in advance: What's your relationship with the OSHA area office? To the extent you have one, I represent 
a firearms manufacturer in New Hampshire who, under the old management, um, the, actually the old owner would, would just tell OSHA to go get a warrant every time they showed up. And they try to explain, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm here for a very small, nope, go get a warrant every time. And what happened was every time those uh, inspections turned into six month wall to wall inspections where OSHA said, fine, you're not, you're not gonna be reasonable. We're not gonna be reasonable and we're just gonna camp out here. And it got so bad to the point where the, the uh, a compliance officer would leave the facility and to only to find his car had been saran wrapped shut. And it's funny until the U.S. Marshals got involved, and and that's not the kind of relationship you want with OSHA. Um, fast forward ahead under new management, now there's a great relationship with OSHA. In fact, OSHA does training in the facility to show other employers how to how to properly operate um, safely in a manufacturing environment. So um, I'm I'm going to fly. By the way, I'm going to fly through these, and you guys. There's a couple of people here in the room. To the extent you guys have questions, feel free. I'm happy to answer any of them. I put the reporting requirements in, and there goes the lights. I put the reporting requirements in because a lot of folks don't uh, don't remember that you you do have an affirmative obligation to call OSHA under certain events, obviously a fatality. But one thing people don't realize is inpatient hospitalization. Oftentimes, folks go to the hospital to be examined after a workplace incident, and they don't get admitted. The 24-hour inpatient hospitalization reporting requirement does not kick in until somebody is actually admitted to the hospital. So you got to remember that. You don't, hey, I'm, I'm going to the ER to get checked out for a laceration, and you're sent home. That's not a reporting event. Like I said, I'm going to repeat myself. I'm going to move quickly through this. Um, I'm going to repeat myself on things that I think on the main points of this. Um, to the extent anybody wants a copy of this presentation or I've got an outline, which a lot of folks like to use the outline as part of their own um, employee handbook or workplace handbook, feel free. It, it, email me and I'll send it to you. No, no problem. Uh, here are some goals. So, so when OSHA shows up, you have to have goals in mind. Obviously, you want to you want to present your workplace in the best possible light. Um, you also want to minimize operational disruptions. OSHA doesn't have the power to shut your operation down. So remember that there there has to be a give and take here in order to minimize not only minimize the disruption but to have. Uh, a, a uh, organized flow of information because OSHA is there to gather information and you want to make sure that that flow of information is controlled as best as possible. Identify concerns early. Um, I like to, which, especially in major cases, usually all cases, but major cases in particular, we try to figure out what, what are your concerns as we go through this inspection. I had a case involving a um, five turbine wind farm up in Berlin, New Hampshire, where General Electric was putting these five turbines online. And there was a two man team and the lead guy was up in the base of the turbine and his coworker was walking up the stairs and uh, he noticed that the, the lead guy was shaking and he thought he was joking until he could smell the burning flesh, he realized, oh my gosh, this guy is being electrocuted right in front of me. And he didn't have um, any insulated anything. So what he did was he, he pulled a, a wrestling move and he jumped up and, and drop kicked his buddy off of the equipment. He hit the deck, his eyes rolled back and he stopped breathing. Performed CPR on his, on his coworker and by the seventh compression he came to and said, oh my, you just saved my life. And he said, okay, you stay here and, and we'll get an ambulance to you. And he said, no, 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 you have to get me out of this turbine. Um, Cause he knew that if you get contacted through your vital organs, you probably don't have long to live. So, and what he wanted to do was call his wife to tell her goodbye. He always chokes me out. So he gets out, he, he calls his wife down in Texas and Long, long story short, he ended up being okay. We found out that the that the 
um, energy passed through his belt that was contacting a piece of metal. And the only thing he lost was half a thumb. Thank, I mean, thankfully it was bad, but that was a, that was a, a near fatality, should have been a fatality. So what, what did we do? We had OSHA all over us saying, you didn't do this, you didn't do this, or thinking you didn't do this, you didn't do this, meaning training, provide the appropriate uh, personal protective equipment. And we identified their concerns early through the entire process. And we said, no, here's the training these guys had. No, here's the PPE they had. Here's the rubber glove testing. I mean, everything we could you know, talk them up and figure out their concerns early. And I, I'll never forget the assistant area director came here and said, uh, at the, they have six months to issue citations. At the end of six months, this, the last day he came in and sat in my conference, he said, LeBeau, I know there's something here, but you're not gonna get citations in this one. And I, I chalk that up to making sure they knew that we were a tight operation. They had stuff to work with, but we were we were we had them off we headed them off at the pass so to speak so from a, from an OSHA perspective that was a success. Um, when OSHA shows up, you got to figure out who's gonna who's gonna determine if OSHA can inspect or you're gonna go get a warrant. I don't recommend to making them go get a warrant, but somebody needs to be able to make that call. Who's gonna gather documents? Who's gonna arrange the interviews? These are all things you need to figure out in advance. Um, who's going to accompany OSHA during the walk around, things like that. Uh, these are the types of inspections. So <clears throat> the opening conference is when OSHA comes and they show you their credentials. Now, I usually, usually never really gave much consideration to, yeah, make sure you, you get their credentials and see who you're dealing with. I like to know that just because I like to know who, uh, which compliance officer we're dealing with, because some of them have specialties, some of them are bullies, some of them are new. So we like to know who's who. But I actually had a situation where where somebody flashed a badge, and it was false. Down and not, not it was a couple of years ago, and the person actually worked for OSHA. He was what they call the OSHA labor liaison, and they have one person in each region. We're in region one. And he used to be a compliance officer 10 years earlier. <clears throat> and by the way, only compliance officers can conduct inspections. Somebody on the job site said, wait a minute, you're not a compliance officer, and, and kicked him off site. How he got on, I don't know, I don't, I don't remember, but, but he ended up issuing $50,000 worth of OSHA penalties, all of which were illegal because he wasn't authorized to even conduct the inspection. And I asked him during a deposition, I said, how many of these have you done that you issued in uh, citations for? He's like, oh, I've done at least a hundred of these. A hundred, and they, nobody ever questioned it because they never asked for the credentials up front. Make sure you ask for the credentials up front so you know who, who you're dealing with. And if it's not a compliance officer, they ain't supposed to be there, at least not alone. Why are they there? Identify the type of inspection, what's the scope, um, figure out the issues, um, the reason we, a reason why we usually want to know exactly what the scope is, because we're, we're going to give up our right to request a warrant. But in return for that, we need to know where you need to go, what you need to see, because we're going to confine you in, into those areas. And we're going to take you in a way that minimizes uh, anything called what's plain view. I had a case down in Wayne, New Jersey for the, uh, the Twinkie company at the time. And it was a massive facility. They made Twinkies, cupcakes, hostess, everything. And what they had was they had on the outside of this massive building, a uh, sugar silo, which metered out powdered sugar. And uh, oftentimes it would jam up, uh, but, but the, you know, Suzy Q line would call for sugar and it would meter out sugar and shoot it through these um, shoot it through these pneumatic tubing, kind of like a, a bank, and um, it would jam up. So they'd have to go outside, turn it off, and then and then unclog the jam. Well, the maintenance supervisor goes out and throws two of the three kill switches and puts his hand up inside. What he didn't turn off was the auger, 
that metered out the sugar and he lost a couple fingers. OSHA finds out about it. They show up in the front office. They say why they're there. And they're only there to see the sugar silo. And instead of taking them outside the building to go to the sugar silo and then back to the front office, they took them through the entire facility. And what they do? They started racking up plain view violations. And so you got to be thinking about that because once you let them in, if they can see it, they can cite it. Um, <clears throat> so reasonableness, they are confined to conduct what's a reasonable inspection. So that's why you can, you can get the compliance officer to agree to certain protocols. Document requests, they're gonna ask for a bunch of documents usually. Um, the big document requests, need, they all need to be in writing. They all need to be in writing so you know what they've asked for and you know what, you're, what you've given them. Um, the Twinkie Company example, during the walkthrough, not only were they just walking through to go to the sugar silo out the back door, they ended up going into the sanitation department and asking for documents there. They went into the maintenance department during the walk around, grabbed documents there. Nobody kept track of what they were doing or grabbing. By the time we got involved, we said, okay, what documents did you give them? Well, I think we gave them lockout tag out. Wait, you think? You didn't keep a record of what you gave them? Well, we kind of remember it was, it, was a, it, was an, it was a mess. It was an absolute mess. So you don't want to be faced with that. You want to say, look, send us your requests. And usually um, they'll tell you during the walk around what documents they want to see. You ask them to send you an email that has all of those requests in writing. Um, another example is down in Londonderry, uh, we had a, a, a big co concrete manufacturer um, and they asked for, I think it was eight items during the walk around and we gave them seven of the eight. We just couldn't, we didn't, I should say we, the client didn't keep track of what the document requests were because they didn't insist on that to be in writing and they didn't give them the, eight, they had the eighth thing, but they didn't give it to them. And OSHA, which is right out my back, back window here, they, uh, decided, huh, <laughs> you don't have this eighth thing. We find that we find that to be problematic. So they end up sending a whole team down uh, to to conduct a wall to wall inspection, um, and they were triggered by the lack of this particular last document that they actually had. At least that's what they told me. They could have been looking for a reason to 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 inspect further, and that's what they used. Um, no lengthy disruptive employee interviews during the walk around. We the their own uh, field inspections manual says. Uh, you've got five minutes with hourly employees. And then, and then uh, other than that, you have to arrange those in advance. This is just another way in which we're not going to be um, unreasonably uh, dealt with. And because we need, we, need, we need to continue our operation. Management representations will all, a management representative will also um, uh, arrange for uh, the re replacement of who they want to interview. And then, and then the other piece of this is management interviews. If a member of management and a member of management will be interviewed during an inspection, if the manager is talking, it's as if the employer is talking. So anything a member of management says is going to be imputed to the, to the employer. So you need to have somebody in the room during the management uh, in interview and usually taking notes. So, so there's, no, um, uh, there, there's no misunderstanding and you remember what was actually said in that interview because it can come back later to haunt you. I'll give you an example. Large uh, grocery chain in the Northeast had in the back rooms, I, I remember being a bagger, I, and, and the back rooms in the 80s, there were fall hazards all over the place because we we're always stacking stuff on top of coolers and wherever we could stack them. Sure enough, this particular grocery chain, you know, kept up that particular uh, old school mode of operation and somebody got hurt um, and willful citations got issued. It was over $500,000 in penalties. And I asked for what's, what's called the OSHA 1As and 1Bs, which is just these typed up forms upon which all citations are issued. And I read um, 
uh, manager Jay said, yeah, I brought the fall protection issues to upper management and they said it was gonna be too expensive to fix. And when I read that, I said, Jay, we're dead in the water. This is, this is, this is an admission. Who was with you in the room when you were interviewed? He's like, nobody. But by the way, Jim, I never said that. That's not even true. I said, okay, so this is an example of you need somebody in the room uh, during these manager interviews. So I had to, I say, OSHA, where are your handwritten notes from the J interview? Because I know you type these other sheets up later. I want to want to make sure the two match. And they fought me a little bit. And I finally got the J interview. And guess what? Nowhere to be found in the J interview notes were any statements that um, he brought this to upper management and upper management chose not to do it. So it was complete fabrication. Um, in my mind, I mean, they fought us on it too. Oh no, he actually said it, I didn't write it down. But that's, that's, that's why you need somebody in the room for management, management interviews. Um, certain things we like to have them have OSHA agree to is, uh, especially during the opening conference, is signing off on compliance officers' notes. Oftentimes they'll take, they'll take copious notes, they'll slide them across the table and say, is that accurate? Uh, yeah, all right, I want you to sign off on those. We're not doing that. That's just not something that managers or supervisors are gonna be doing typically um, because that doesn't tell the whole story and we just don't wanna get into a situation where we're confined, uh, especially if it's inaccurate. Um, no tape recorder to videotapes, manager interviews. Again, um, whatever is said on videotape is, is you're gonna be stuck with. And so um, I'll never forget we had a, uh, down at um, a steel company in Marlboro, Mass. We had a big facility and we, we had to have a vendor come in, an electrical vendor to come in and change the lighting. And so the, the vendor came in, had a, had a bunch of ladders on his truck, but he decides he, he just doesn't wanna, I think the weather was bad. He didn't wanna use the ladders on the truck. So he found this scrap ladder was, it, you'll see a picture of it. It's, you would never use it, but he decides he's gonna use it. He falls and he lands on his head and he, and he, ends, up, he ends up dying. So this is a bad accident. And this is a bad accident for a couple of reasons. One, we lost a, a life in our facility that shouldn't have happened. And two, <clears throat> now we've got a vendor who is, who's passed away on our property. And from a lawyer's perspective, I'm thinking, okay, so workers comp does not bar any claims. This could be a problem. OSHA rolls in. This is one of, this is one of the times where you wanna know who you're dealing with. Alan Burbank is the, is the compliance officer and he's, He's a notorious, I don't want to say bully, but he's a bully. Um, and uh, he said, uh, Mr. LeBeau, I'm going to interview you the five managers. I said, uh, at once? Yes. I said, okay, well, Alan, it's your, it's, your, it's your inspection. Sure. And I'm going to record it. I said, no, you're not going to record it. And he says, says who? Like nobody had ever mentioned this before, even, even stood their ground to him before. So, well, um, it's not company policy and very polite. And it's in your field operations manual that if we withhold consent, you, you, don't, you, don't, you don't tape the manager interviews. And he stormed out, called his boss, stormed back in and said, we're gonna do this the hard way. Okay, what does that mean? We're gonna get subpoenas and then he left. So, well, first, we're not gonna have managers being tape recorded when I haven't prepped any of them for a deposition and, and this had just happened really. And so we had to stand our ground and long story short, I got on the phone with his boss and said, hey, Tony, you understand that you can't, you can't be tape recording, especially a fatality case, people, uh, managers who don't wanna be tape recorded. He said, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, he agreed. Alan comes back in with a couple more compliance officers. They, they finished the inspection and it was all hunky-dory. Everybody was real nice and there was no, there was no issues. And, and we got citations, but they're all minor and they're completely unrelated to the fatality. So standing our ground ended up working out in our benefit. Um, and so you have to be able to stand your ground and knowing how to, how to manage an inspection is, is a big piece of it. If there's gonna be IH testing, so lead testing, 
uh, hexavalent chromium, you know, whatever. Uh, OSHA has to give you an opportunity to get your own IH person there. Um, we had we had uh, at the at the uh, Cincinnati Gas and Electric. It was a coal-fired power plant, and OSHA claimed that there was an explosion hazard because of the um, buildup of coal dust on horizontal surfaces. And so they took a sample and, and we said, wait a minute, we need to have an IH person take a sample too. And we're gonna send it out for testing and theirs came, turned up explosive and ours didn't. Um, and so that helped us kind of counter um, their experts report. And oftentimes their chain of custody because they have to send all their stuff out to Salt Lake City is usually not that good. So um, that's just an example. Oh, and that's another example of we're doing a walk around and this is back when they had handheld videotape. And during the walk around, OSHA is running the videotape and we had told them up, in, up at front at the, at the opening conference that we were not gonna allow a videotape of manager interviews. And they agreed, no problem. But during the walk around, they're asking questions. And we said, look, you're running the camera, We'll answer your questions truthfully, but just put the camera down. And so they 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 acted like they shut it off and they put it down. I looked and I could see the green light was still on. They were still recording. So we called them on it and they stopped recording. But that not not all OSHA compliance officers. In fact, the vast majority are are straight shooters. But you just got to be worried about these types of things happening. And those are just examples of how to stand up for your rights. Also. If there's going to be trade secrets, business confidential information, um, say, look, we'll we'll take the photos of that, or we're going to we'll videotape that. If you have those types of things in your facility, a lot of folks say, you know, we don't really have any trade secret or business confidential stuff. Your contracts are business confidential, so you're going to want to stamp those. Excuse me, business confidential, especially in a construction field where the general contractor is being asked to provide the contracts with their subcontractors, which reveal you know, how the subs got the job usually. Um, stamp all of that confidential because otherwise they could be subject to a Freedom of Information Act by your competitors, third parties. Um, your walk around team just needs to know, here's the game plan folks. Um, and and it's, it's in essence, Who's going to get documents? How are we going to handle interviews? Um, understand the areas of the facility where OSHA is not looking to go, so don't take them there. Um, everybody really needs to understand that OSHA is not there to help; they're there to build a, a case against you. And and you know, one thing about answering questions truthfully, obviously, you're not going to lie to OSHA. They'll tell you that it violates Title 18 and you could be subject to criminal prosecution. But telling the truth means, did you see it, taste it, touch it, hear it, smell it? If so, you could probably talk about it. But if you didn't, you're probably giving opinion, and opinion is not truth. And when OSHA asks questions, especially on the stuff they want to hear answers to, and you answered them, they'll probably stare at you. And you'll feel the need to fill the dead air. Don't do it. If you've answered it as far as you know, then you're done. I can't tell you how many times, especially in, in fatality cases where opinions just start th being thrown out and then they get written down as, as accurate, truthful answers. And they're not, they're clearly opinion at the time they're given, but when they make it on a piece of paper, it, it's considered fact. So everybody needs to refrain from giving opinion. You guys doing right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, again, I'm going to repeat myself, but but everybody just needs to know. Hey, if there's a document request, it's got to go through one person. Um, avoid admissions. The uh, admission that something is a violation is uh, is a legal opinion, so try to avoid that. We already talked about plain view in the Twinkie example. Again, if OSHA is in a place where they're legally allowed to be, and usually they are when you invite them in, anything they see, uh, they can cite. Just some tips. Usually our main contact person is doing a lot of the quarterbacking here. 
scheduling interviews, gathering documents. They may ask you for hazard assessments. Um, this was a big push several years ago where they would require a written piece of paper that says, yes, I have determined that that job task requires the employee to wear X, Y, and Z PPE. They wanna see a piece of paper that shows that you've actually done that analysis. And usually I say, look, we don't have a piece of paper, but you see everybody in that job task is wearing the PPE you want them to wear. Somebody did an assessment. So that's usually where those fights go. Injury and illness records. Um, they're gonna, they are gonna automatically ask you for three years of the 300 form. Um, you have a four hour window in which to provide this. If you don't provide it within four hours, technically that's a violation. Nine times out of 10, they'll say, you know what? Just throw it in the, doc the full document request, the eight or 10 that we're gonna ask and we're good. Sometimes they'll say, well, you know what? We do wanna see the injury and, injury and illness log. So um, you have to be able to show those and usually they're done by computer or you can say, I'll call you, I'll call the home office and have them emailed to you. So that's usually how that, that's dealt with if the compliance officer is a stickler for the four hour rule. I would love to be on every inspection, that would be awesome, but um, you don't need a lawyer, typically in most cases. And that's why, that's why you're attending this, this seminar because um, you can handle most of this. And if I send you my outline or send you this, this particular presentation, you follow these rules, you don't typically need lawyers there. Now, if you have a catastrophic event, near, near fatality kind of thing, something, something collapses, I'm handling the, the government center garage collapse case in Boston. You know, that's a clear example of when you need lawyers right up front, not, not only to deal with the flow of information, but you know, coordinating with insurance carriers, coordinating with other uh, contractors if, if they're there, things like that. Um, and, in, and in a fatality case, which that was, they are gonna send uh, their first level criminal investigators. And so, I, and I know those people and you need to be able to genuflect and give them the appropriate deference and information so you stay out of harm's way. Production methods, I don't know who might, that might um, uh, affect here, but uh, there's a case in, in Chicago where we had a uh, group lockout tagout was a production method implicated in an OSHA citation that was, I think it was a $1,500 uh, citation uh, against Exelon. I mean, they can, they can afford that, their nuclear power plant, but, but the change in the group out lockout tagout was gonna cost them an extra million, million two a year. And so, that's a production method that's implicated if OSHA gets their way, you might wanna consider having, having council present for that. If OSHA takes a picture during the inspection, you take a picture. Oh, oftentimes they'll say, no worry, we'll share these with you. And they don't, they don't share them with you until you get into a, con a contest period. So um, sometimes they'll show them to you, but they usually only show you the ones that uh, help them. Uh, and sometimes that's good to know. Um, we had a, a trenching violation in Concord many years ago now um, where, where OSHA said, look, you had a guy in a trench that was more than five feet deep and you didn't have a trench box. And our response was that guy was fully trained and we had a trench box right there and it was gonna go in. And we, we could not have predicted that that employee was gonna get in the trench. We had nobody in management, which is usually what it comes down to, knew that that guy was gonna be in the trench. The reason that is important is because OSHA is not a strict liability statute. The OSHA Act is not a strict liability statute. And OSHA, and this is a big piece of my defense in most cases, is OSHA has to prove that the employer knew or should have known with the exercise of reasonable diligence that an employee was going to do something unsafe. And in this instance, getting, getting into a trench. And we could prove to, to, to OSHA, we trained him not to do it. We had enough oversight to keep him from doing it. We had disciplinary records, which is a big piece of the puzzle. You know, Because if you don't discipline your employees for, for violating safety rules, 
then your safety rules are basically worthless. So, but we had it all covered. And so I gave this great presentation at the, at the uh, informal conference after we got the citations and assistant area director, Steve Rook was smirking. And I said, okay, what? You've got something. He said, How do, he did have a photo he wanted to share with me. And the photo was the, the kid in the hole in the trench, but next to him was his manager. And they were both waving at OSHA taking the picture. So uh, that's an instance where they, they kind of got us because knowledge is imputed through your manager. And if your manager's in the hole too with them without a trench box, your goose is cooked. Um, but we were able to settle it after we said, gosh, golly gee, we didn't know that. And we didn't. Um, again, ma make sure, the, the reason, a reason why this is a part of the, part of the uh, slides is we had at the Twinkie facility, again, in Wayne, New Jersey, they wanted a photograph. No, 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 this is the other Twinkie facility up in Bitterford, Maine. They, they wanted a photograph of the machine that put the squirrels on the hostess cupcake. And I said, yeah, I got, and I looked to my um, a client and they said, no, 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 that's business confidential. We'll take the picture of that swirly mechanism and we'll send it to you appropriately stamped business confidential. So um, I didn't know that but I learned quickly. Again, I'm repeating myself, um, parallel monitoring for IH. Make sure you only give them what they're entitled to as a matter of law. You know, if they asked for <clears throat> your injury and illness logs, just give them what they've asked for. Um, the lockout tagout program, if you, if you need to have it, hopefully you do provide it to them. Um, yeah, I think you're going to know from a gut level whether or not something is reasonable because uh, they have to limit their request to what's reasonable. Be wary of HIPAA violations, privacy rights, things like that. Personnel files are not, not supposed to be provided to, to OSHA. I like to organize documents. Just make sure. So, so when they give you the list of documents they 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 are asking for, um, provide a provide a cover sheet with the documents or a cover email with the documents you're providing them, saying you've asked for this, you're getting this. You've asked for this, we can't find this, or we're still looking. Just just diary what you've done in response to their document request, so everybody's on the same page. I also like the Bates number, but don't worry about that. I'm just being a lawyer nerd. Uh, but but later on, if if uh, we give them a lot of documents and we're negotiating, it's nice to be on the same page, literally. Again, um, non -sup maybe I didn't say this, non-supervisory employee interviews. This is, you can't really control them. This is where OSHA gets most of their evidence for violations. Oftentimes the evidence, I'm putting in air quotes, is because there's a misunderstanding during those interviews. We try to um, prepare any hourly employee interviews by, by sitting down with them. Um, we had a, a, a accident in Newport where a individual uh, in essence caught their face on fire and had to be life flighted to Dartmouth. Um, and it was in the papers. And so we knew that OSHA would be coming very soon. So we sat down with all of the hourly employees uh, who were in the room at the time of the accident and, and simply went over their rights. We went over their training. Um, and so that was really the best we could do in getting them prepared. We did tell them, and you'll see on a slide in a minute, that they have the right to ask for somebody to be with them during their interview. I will tell you, it it doesn't go it doesn't go over well to have uh, an employee say, "Hey, I want I want I want my manager in with me." Oh, she usually fights that, but it's their right, and they can say that. Um, but you during these types of pre OSHA briefings, we say, "Look, you have this opportunity to say no to X, Y, and Z, um, but it's it's up to you. You're the one that has to exercise those rights, and that that's where you have to leave it." Um, one piece of that is obviously tell them that you can refuse to be 
audio tape, videotape. They're going to ask you to sign a statement. You can refuse all of that. So, so they can go in for the interview and answer questions truthfully, but they can they can say, look, I'm drawing the line at signing off on a statement, or I don't want to be audio taped or videotaped. Those are things that uh, they can they can obviously do. Um, make sure they understand some of the terminology that they they may hear during the uh, OSHA interview. Go over training records, like I said. Um, one of the big things is to make sure the employees understand that the employer wants full cooperation with OSHA and that nothing they say during the, the OSHA interview is going to be used against them, right? So they're not going to be terminated. They're not going to be demoted uh, for speaking with OSHA. That is a protected activity, one of many. And um, if you violate that, they can bring a Section 11C or a whistleblower action against you. And, and once you're in that uh, arena, it takes forever to get out. But what happens is OSHA becomes a private attorney for that employee who you've been demoted or fired. Now, we've had situations where we just um, we just had to fire them because of what had happened on site. Uh, we had a, an electrocution case. Somebody died in Tennessee working on high voltage wires. And when we got there, after, right after the accident, we noticed that the working location had protective grounds on either side of it. And we said, were those grounds up at the time of the accident? Because if they were, the energy should have gone around the employee and, and the employee should have been safe. And the, the guys that were there said, yes, those were there. And they told the cops that, and they told OSHA that. And we brought in an expert to look at it. And he said, there's no way those grounds were there. It doesn't make sense. And so a week or two later, we said, we, we brought the employees in one at a time. And, and one of them finally broke and said, you know what? We put those up after the accident. They had been up there. They took them down. And the person that got killed decided, oh, I left something up there. He needed to go back up for whatever reason and got electrocuted. And these guys decided to cover their tracks and put these grounds up and then lied to the police and then lied to OSHA and lied to us. So we terminated them and they had the, they had the guts to file a, a whistleblower case against the employer for being fired. Um, thankfully, OSHA saw through that quickly and, and, and dropped the case, but um, that's just an extreme example. There's other cases where um, even, even the most meritorious termination ends up, you end up getting stuck in the whistleblower uh, system and it takes sometimes years to get out of it. Um, again, you, employees can have management council present, but try to, try to avoid upsetting OSHA during that. There's all kinds of reasons why management could be present during employee, hourly employee uh, interviews, but you usually don't wanna insert yourself into that. Uh, but here's what you definitely have to do is debrief with the hourly employee, the non-management employee interviews, because what OSHA is worried about, you're worried about. And I can't tell you some of the newer uh, compliance officers say, you know, they'll tell the hourly employee, your employer can't ask you what, what, what we talked about in here, okay? You, you can't. That's completely false. What sometimes they confuse is the whistleblower. You can't be terminated. You can't be demoted for what you said in the interview. But the employer is absolutely entitled to find out what is what were the questions? What did you say? Uh, because what OSHA is concerned about, we're concerned about. This is all about employee safety, right? Yes. Well, then we, we need to know. Because oftentimes OSHA is not going to. Um, they're going to issue a citation months and months down the road, and it's it's about an immediate hazard. Well, you need to find out about the immediate hazard because you need to correct it if it's there. Again, we talk about management interviews. Anything they say is going to be imputed to the employer, so you've got to be very careful. Um, know about signing off. Um, one thing about, you know, I say no audio or signing a statement. There are times, and I had a recent one down in Massport, where um, we had those, those cranes that go over container ships and, and, and empty the container ships. 
um, we had a we had a group um, working on that, and the crane operator was not the normal operator. He was the maintenance guy, and he decides he's going to go seaward when our people were in harm's way, and they always check by radio, check visually, make sure everybody's clear. Didn't do that. Ran them over. Awful. And um, his wife is just just devastated. Um, just because of this foolishness. But um, that was a situation where the OSHA compliance officer said, look, I need to, I need to audio tape your people. And that's when I initially said no. And then I said, you know what? We got, we got nothing to hide. I think we're relatively well prepared. We want to cooperate, go for it. So as long as you give me a copy of the tape. And so we agreed to it. So those are situations, it's a, it's a game time situation. We always want to cooperate with OSHA, and there are times in which you say, "Look, fine, we'll we'll allow the audio tape." Sure. We're not demonstrating work processes, though. Uh, Murphy's law kicks in. I can't tell you every time um, had a pipe assembly break, guy lost two fingers. Uh, the the pipe assembly sitting on the ground of the shop, and OSHA says, "How much is that pipe assembly? I mean, how much does it weigh?" And the manager says, well, I can just kind of, I could, it's still hooked to the crane, overhead crane, so I can pick it up and give you a, a weight. And so he did that and lifted it up maybe two inches off the ground just so they could get an accurate weight. Uh, extra citation for failure to rig it properly. I mean, it, anyway, we're not demonstrating anything for, for OSHA because it's just going to be used against you. I talked about it at the beginning. There's no demand to stop work. Only a U.S. District Court judge has that power. Um, you're going to be offered after the inspection is over a closing conference. Um, definitely, definitely take advantage of the closing conference, but you're not going to learn anything other than what violations were allegedly found. And so, press for uh, an understanding of the exact regulations in play. So, th so then you're going to know. Um, and th this is normally not a uh, a conference when you want counsel present. Now you're going to get now you're going to get citations, and you have 15 working days, which excludes weekends and federal holidays, in which to contest. And you want to schedule the informal conference, which is where you can actually try and settle the settle the citations. And I'd say a vast majority of citations are settled at the informal conference. Um, take advantage of that because you always learn something new or different about your case, and you can you can actually um uh settle it and this this is oftentimes when we just we provide further information this compliance directives interpretation letters things like that um keep in mind this the penalties are are going up every year and if you accept a well if you accept any citation for a particular hazard, that citation is gonna haunt you for five years because OSHA has a five year window in which to issue repeat citations. And so you could take a serious citation today that's, you know, you pay a penalty of $2,500. If that same or similar hazard is found in the next five years, you could be facing $156,000 in penalties per repeat. So you gotta take everything, seriously um, when you get issued citations. And oftentimes we can get, um, we, can, we can minimize if, you, if there's a clear reason for the citations, we can, we can get them um, re, rejiggered to be less of a threat down the road. And oftentimes we can get them withdrawn too, if there's merit. Um, and I, I talked about the contest. You can't miss the employer contest deadline, 15 working days because uh, if you miss that date, then uh, good luck. You're not gonna be able to get around it. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. I do have some photos. That's the, uh, that's, that's the um, ladder I talked about in the steel facility in Marlboro. You can see, uh, it's not very clear, but there are the medical supplies that the EMTs use to try to resuscitate. Uh, we didn't talk about this. That's the base of the wind tower up in Berlin. We didn't talk about this, but just remember, you can't, you can't run gas powered um, 
machinery inside a closed milk uh, cooler that was here in town. Uh, the two young kids that were running that, uh, they were found passed out on the floor within minutes. Thankfully, somebody was walking by and saw it um, and called. They didn't wake up till they're halfway to the hospital. That's how quick carbon monoxide can get you. This is the coal fire power plant down in uh, Cincinnati where they were running the, the video camera after they said we told them not to. We didn't talk about this. This is the Bryant uh, Athletic Center uh, collapse case. Um, nobody, nobody was seriously hurt here, thankfully. Uh, we had guys tied off to that when it went over. Um, and OSHA came in and blamed the steel erector 100%. And then we were able to prove that the, uh, the concrete had not cured. The certificates uh, that the concrete had cured were false. Trenching is not something to, to play with. This is a trench that's not even, not even four and a half feet deep. And we had a young guy, um, for whatever reason, jumped in the trench as it was collapsing. And it, it just collapsed up to his waist but the pressure was so great, it severed his femoral artery and he, he didn't survive. Um, in fact, the, he, was, he, was, he was gone by the time the ambulance got him out, out of the property. These are all cheery things. Um, last one, this is, these are just examples of, you know, when you least expect it, bad things are gonna happen. This is down in Delaware. We were pulling down the old GE plant in Delaware. And that cable was hooked to a steel piece of steel uh, that had been cut. And when um, the steel uh, came free, it submerged in through the concrete and broke the cable. And these are this is from a video being taken. And the gentleman to the right was the supervisor. He ended up getting hit and thrown 80 feet. At least he was killed on impact. But these are these are the types of things that happen when you least expect it, and OSHA is really coming for you uh, when you have such a tragic event. And the better prepared you are, the better off you're going to be down the road. So that's kind of it. You guys have any questions? No, it's really important. All right. Are there any situations where, and this might be an ignorant question, uh, are there any situations where OSHA would just like stop by, swing through, and it, when something big has not happened? Yeah, so um, OSHA has certain um, responsibilities to stop in when they drive by and they see certain things. If they see, if they drive by and they see, for example, fall, usually fall protection is big. So if you don't have fall protection when you should, or you're misusing ladders, they, they, you know, if they drive by site and you don't have a ladder that's three rungs above the access point, they automatically stop to, to come talk to you. And then they issue citations usually. But once they're on site, they may see other things. But um, fall protection and uh, trenching hazards are two in which uh, they stop in, you know, because they see it. Mm. Um, but they can't, they can't necessarily come on a job site uh, you know, target you unless they've got a reasonable basis because they, they'll have to articulate a reasonable basis if you tell them to go get a warrant. They can't just say, oh, you know, we heard about these guys and we didn't hear anything about safety and health, but we want to just go check them out, see if they're doing anything right. Um, that's not what happens. Um, sometimes you'll get, you'll come up on their um, high hazard industry, industry list. Mm -hmm. um, and, but usually if you're a smaller employer, you won't end up on that list. Unless you have an accident. Okay. If you have an accident, are you more likely to be visited more frequently? You will. Yeah. Yeah. Depends on the accident. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, they have to find out about it. And then uh, once they find out about it, once you make it into their system, they'll be looking out for you usually. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Jim, can I ask you a quick question? Hey, this is Kathleen Davidson. I'm over at Pastore France. Oh, hold on. Let me turn, let me turn up the volume. Okay. Right. I'm going to try to turn up the volume. Make it. 
Okay, try that again. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, excellent. Um, so this is Kathleen Davidson at Pastore Crayons. Um, really awesome presentation, thank you. Um, so I just had a question because um, I was really interested in when you were talking about um, being allowed to debrief the employee to ask what questions they were asked and what answers they gave. Um, I had a client end up in an investigation that started with a wage and hour investigation. And while they were there, they claimed they saw some minors up on a roof, minors meaning under 18, not who mine, um, and that they weren't supposed to be up there. And so these minors turned out to be my client's son and his friend. So obviously he was very concerned about his son's safety and wanted to put an immediate stop to any kind of safety violation, exactly what you were talking about. So he asked the kids, have you been on the roof? And the kids said, no. And he said, okay, well, why am I hearing from a Department of Labor investigator that they saw you on the roof? Well, I don't know. And somehow that got back to the investigator and he got tagged with interference for asking um, the kids whether they were on the roof. And so our defense was exactly what you were talking about, that he had an obligation to make the site safe. The kids were still working there. He had to, and they essentially said, well, you can tell them they can't be on the roof. Um, you can ask if they were on the roof, but you can't ask whether what I asked them and what, what they told me from the investigator. Wrong. I, from, that's from, too. <laughs> so, yeah, no, we, that's wrong. And, and, uh, um, yeah, was this an OSHA inspector locally here? Um, yeah, this was New Hampshire, and it, it was done very poorly, and we appealed a whole lot of it and ended up settling it, but um, they they just said that he had no right to ask anything about what the investigators asked anybody. Uh, and, well, if, if there's an OSHA investigator asking questions, you absolutely can debrief and find out what they talked about. There's no prohibition to that. The prohibition kicks in when you, when you, when you, terminate solely based on the fact that they talked to OSHA. Hey, so does that change at all if it what started with a wage and hour investigator asking the questions? So um, I don't know if the wage and I don't know enough about wage and hour investigations uh, to answer that. I mean, we've got folks here that know more about wage and hour, but but those those types of um, uh, those types of referrals happen all the time in interagency and um, from from OSHA's perspective, at least from the OSHAC perspective, there's no prohibition to uh, debrief employees. And I suspect there's no prohibition anywhere else for that matter. Thanks, I appreciate the input. Sure, not a problem, Kathleen. I have a question. Um, so you talked a little bit between the difference between the, the hourly employees and management employees, not how you treat them different, but then that story, of the manager who is in the trench. <laughs> so how, it seems like information from managers is just treated differently from OSHA. How, how right. did that get resolved? Right, so uh, we ended up having to pay a fine and accepting, okay. so we ended up having to accept the citation. Um, I guess- So uh, the, the manager messed something up, it really is on you. It's not 100%. Um, so for example, the Twinkie company um, finger loss case, that was a manager. Um, and so, but, but there is a defense that's hard to prove, but you can prove it. It's called uh, uh, the unpreventable employee misconduct defense. And you can prove that with management level employees as well, but you, you've got, it's, it's a lot harder. And so I asked the client if they had the, the high level of evidence that we needed to to say that the manager um, was was appropriately trained or disciplined and things like that. And they said, no, no, we don't have enough on this one. So we'll just settle, settle now quickly. Um, but in the Twinkie Company case, uh, we got it all thrown out. So. James, do you recommend um, uh, like OSHA 10? So. It's it's better than nothing, but um, when OSHA comes a calling and they find out that the supervisors who are in charge of safety only have an OSHA 10, they don't like that. They want you to have an OSHA 30. So um, 
OSHA 10, every time I say, well, these all these guys have OSHA 10s, they're like, we don't care. That's an, that's an overview course, and it's really meaningless to us. So 10 is great if it's if it's better than nothing, but uh, 30 if you want to get, you really want to. So uh, just having an OSHA training like that, for lack of a better word, like shield you from anything? Yeah, so absolutely. So the knowledge component that we talked about before is they require that your guys have been properly trained in the hazards that are, they're going to face on a day-to-day -day basis. And the 30 typically covers that. And so, no, that's a, very helpful. And it's a shark repellent, let's put it that way. It mm -hmm. really is. So in those cases, you know, in the, the, the OSHA 10 is, is so generalized, you cover everything, right? Electrics to hand tools to everything. Dorn and I have both gone through it. Um, that when you have such a specialized industry mm. that five of the 30 hours actually apply to what you do. Yeah. And so you pay for all of this extra stuff. I can see if you're a general contractor, if yeah. you're working with different subs from multiple different categories within industry, where there are lots of different hazards, where you do need to have this overarching so, training. Yep. So, so there are um, both locally and online um, specialized courses you can take that are immersion courses, so to speak, in um, the sub parts, these are all broken up. This is, so this is the regulation. This is the 1910. This is construction, this is general industry. And there are sub parts in the regs. And you can, you can take uh, training and you can get certified on deep dives into whatever sub parts you guys deal with. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's probably mm -hmm. what you wanna do is like a focused yeah. training. Do you have recommendations for what to take, who to talk to. Right, so contractors risk management, who is here in town, um, OSHA region one, throughout entire region one, they consider those guys to be the gold standard. And so they're worth chatting. Brian Stevens uh, is is my, con well, one of my contacts there. What was the name again? Contractors risk management, also known as CRM USA. Um, they're good, and they have a lot of ex-OSHA compliance officers, so they uh, they come at it from every angle. 